This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. It has been a joyous week in our family. We were blessed. We have been blessed with a new baby, a baby boy born late Sunday night, eight pounds, nine ounces. He looks like the rest of them. He's definitely ours. Thank God the baby is doing well. Thank God the mom is doing well. Please God, we have a bris planned and scheduled for Monday morning. Most likely at the Torch Center, though it's not finalized. It's a busy week, as you might imagine. The week after a baby boy specifically is born, you have a lot of stuff you need to do. You got to secure a mile for the circumcision, for the bris. You have to get a venue. You got to make sure that there's catering. And, you know, for all my sons, I merited to give a, give us a little speech on Friday night by the Shalom Zachar, which is the, the party that we make. The Friday night after a baby boy is born. And I also merited to speak by all the brisses. So I got to prepare that. And I got to deal with the kids and the transportation and the hospital. and trying to figure out what to call the young lad. 
and of course, all the other kids, they need extra special attention and TLC. They have all this envy. There's a new baby that shows up and that is nudging them, is elbowing them out of their cherished and coveted spot. And you got to make the older child feel like a sense of ownership, responsibility. Oh, it's your baby and give your baby the baby's pacifier and be responsible for the baby. And they have to make sure that they, you know, they feel extra special. Otherwise they, they really act out. And I still have all my responsibilities. Torch doesn't have the most generous paternity leave policy. Uh, I'm just kidding. I could take off. I could take off whenever I want. Are they really going to fire me now? Come on. That would never happen. That's like, that's like Apple firing Steve Jobs. It would never happen, right? But in all seriousness, it's been a super busy week. I remember thinking when my son Yoshua was born, I remember thinking that that, that week between the birth and the bris, I remember thinking that I've never been this busy and hectic in my entire life. And I recalled what happened last time when my son Yisrael Mayer was born. We had been on a massive newsletter writing streak, released a new newsletter with like a massive email with 4,000 words. We've been doing it every week. And the baby's born. Thank God, baby's doing well. And I said, you know what? Maybe we'll take a few weeks off just just because there's a new baby. So I took a few weeks off. And then once you get out of habit, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, and it's not absolutely necessary, we could always pick it up next week. You know, very few people are breathlessly awaiting the new newsletter, you know, hitting refresh in the inbox. I'm not going to get too much flack from not doing it. And you know what? Everyone's inboxes is, is they're they're bulging enough as is. Man, who actually reads it? Is it really necessary? And before you know it, you lose the momentum, and it's really hard to regain it. So I decided that in honor of my new baby that the Almighty gave us, I'm going to try to restart the newsletter. And amid all the the madness and the bedlam and the chaos and the mayhem and the upheaval that a new baby throws into your life. Of course, it's the greatest blessing in the world. When you have all the excuses in the world to cave and to do less work, let's go in the opposite direction. Let's try to do more. Now, I didn't, I didn't tell anyone in my family, this is going to be our little secret. But if a, if a new newsletter hits your inbox before shops, you know I pulled it off, but hopefully this will kickstart a new streak of newsletters Every week in honor of the new Walby baby, the yet to be named Walby baby. I can think of no better way to celebrate the arrival of the newest Walby with doing more, more Torah and, and writing more newsletter articles and having more podcasts. Let's go. Let's go. This is the first Parsha podcast that I've recorded in 2024. Last week, the new episode, even though it was re- released on Wednesday evening, it was actually recorded in 2023 on Sunday because, you know, we were expecting and it was past the due date. And I, I wanted to make sure that the podcast is in the books just in case you had to hustle to the hospital. So this, this is the first time I've done this in 2024. I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I snuck away. I'm here, and let's begin Parshas Vaera. It's 2024. Could you believe it? You remember Y2K? I was 13, and even I knew that it was not a serious problem. But that's that's basically a quarter century ago. Four of those is a hundred years. Time really flies. My father likes to say, in instances like this, time flies, we have to repent very quickly. Because we never know when our tenure in this world will end. We have to repent the day before we die. 
And when is that? But it's 2024. And of course, our thoughts and prayers are in Israel. And we dedicate our studies today in the merit of the success of our soldiers on the battlefront, to their safety, to their health, to their success. And of course, we dedicate our studies to the hostages stuck in Gaza under deplorable conditions. Their life is hanging on a thread. May the Almighty protect all of us and save us all from our enemies. May the Jewish people ascend once again. May we merit to see the redemption and the ingathering of our nation. May the name of the Almighty be ubiquitous in the world. And may we be fortunate to play some part, some tiny part, in helping effectuate that glorious day. Of course, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. In this special Parsha podcast, there's only going to be one segment. I actually had two more segments. We were going to do three, but the more I thought about it, this one is so important. It's so critical for us in our lives. It's going to be such an instructive and topical subject. I decided to focus just on this. Now, it's a subject which is easy to talk about, but it's much harder to implement. And hopefully, when we talk about it, we'll also take a step to try to figure out how we can get a bit more of this in our lives. So, Parshas Va'era picks up right where Parshas Shemos ended off, and we're in middle of a conversation between Moshe and the Almighty. At the end of last week's Parsha, Moshe was levying a complaint against God. God had instructed Moshe, commissioned Moshe to go save the Jewish people. And Moshe objected, one objection after another. And finally, he consented, he agreed, he acceded to go. He gets permission from Jethro, he rendezvous with Aaron, he convinces the elders, he goes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh does not cave to his demand. And instead of releasing the Jewish people from their bondage, instead of attenuating, mitigating, reducing their burden and enslavement, he exacerbates it. He makes it worse. Previously, he had been providing them with the ingredients for bricks. And now he instructs his taskmasters to withhold those ingredients and to demand that the daily quota of bricks be maintained. And the nation is foraging everywhere to find the required ingredients, and all this could be blamed on Moshe and Aaron. And the people complained to Moshe and Aaron, what did you do? You should have kept your mouth silent. And Moshe goes to God. He says, why did you send me? I wanted to improve the state of the nation, and instead, things got worse. And the end of last week's parsha, God responded, God began to respond by saying, not to worry, you'll still see that that I will do to Pharaoh, for he will release the nation with a strong hand, and he will in fact evict them from the land. And our parsha begins with God continuing his message. I pray to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with this mode of divine relationship, but not in that mode, in a different mode. I promised, but I didn't deliver. And now I'm going to deliver. I'm going to extract the nation from Egypt. I'm going to bring them to the land of Canaan. I heard the cries of the Jewish people. I remembered my covenant. And now I once again instruct you to go speak to the nation. And tell them that I will take you out of the servitude and suffering and torment of Egypt. I'm going to save you from the labor. I'm going to redeem you with a strong arm, with great wonders. I'm going to take you to me to be my nation, and I will be your God, and I will bring you to the land. This is a very hopeful and encouraging message that God is instructing Moshe to convey to the Jewish people. Those are the first seven verses of our Parsha. And Moshe does as instructed. Verse 8. So this is chapter 6, verse, excuse me, verse 9 of chapter 6. Vaidaber Moshe. And Moshe spoke. He told these words to Bnei Israel, to the Israelites. 
So Moshe has the initial efforts, they flop. Pharaoh makes it worse. The people complain to Moshe. Moshe complains to God. God responds. God encourages Moshe to go again. He does with a very hopeful message. And it falls flat. Velo Shamuel Moshe. They did not hear. They did not heart. They did not heed. They did not listen to Moshe. Mikotzer ruach umeavodat kasha. Because of shortness of breath and harsh labor. This is where if you think about it, if you would map out the story, this is the, not the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning of one stage of exile. Everything that happens henceforth is going to be positive. It's going to be accretive to the nation. They're going to leave. This is the low point. This is the nadir. This is the darkest before dawn. Moshe has an encouraging message to share to the Jewish people. And he shares the message, and they don't hear him. Mikotze ruach, they have shortness of breath, and they are being subjected to harsh labor. Now, the Ramban, he differentiates what is shortness of breath and what is harsh labor. Shortness of breath, he explains, that is their fear that they will be killed if they listen to Moshe. What is the harsh labor? Why did that prevent them from hearing what Moshe had to say? That refers to the fact that the nation was so inundated with work that they were not capable of hearing and thinking about what Moshe had to say. There's two reasons, says the way the Ramban explains the verse. There's two reasons why the nation did not hear what Moshe had to say. Number one, shortness of breath which he explains, is that they understood that this would be a capital offense, and therefore we don't want to listen to Moshe. And harsh labor, that refers to a different reason why the nation was incapable of hearing what Moshe had to say. The labor was so intense. The enslavement was so unrelenting that they did not have a moment of peace, of quiet, of serenity, to be able to listen and to consider and to evaluate with Mo- what Moshe had to say. They didn't have a second to think, to listen properly, or to contemplate. And this is what I'm going to focus on in this week's Parsha podcast. The nation was so consumed with labor that they could not even hear what Moshe had to say. They were drowning in work, in labor, in servitude, that that disabled their ability, that precluded them from being able to even hear what Moshe had to say. They were in their own world, immersed in their work, compelled, of course, to do this work, forced and enslaved against their will to do this work. And the work was so all-encompassing that they got into their own little world And Moshe, he's saying things, and he's trying to convey a message, and it's a nuanced message, and it comes from God. I'll take you, and I'll I'll, I'll bring you, and I'll I'll, I'll extract you, and, and miracles, all these nice things. And it doesn't penetrate. It cannot enter their universes. They're sealed off from the world. Moshe's unable to make an impact. His words make no impression. And this is a part of what the nation, the state of the nation at this time. And of course, it's by design. I want to argue that this is the essence of the enslavement. What Pharaoh was doing to the nation was primarily about thwarting their ability to have the time, the capacity, the space to think, to plan, to scheme, to consider, to evaluate, to contemplate. And they reach the point over here in this verse of peak enslavement, peak labor, labor that's so suffocating that there's just, there's no window out of it. 
There's nothing that can be conveyed to them. There's no message, there's no sentiment that can be told to them that would even be considered. And once that happened, they've fulfilled the prophecy that they will be enslaved. Now they're ready for redemption. They're ripe for salvation, for deliverance. Now this idea is already hinted to in last week's parsha. So Moshe goes, chapter 5, goes to Pharaoh and demands the nation be released. And Pharaoh is quite incredulous at Moshe's request. Who is this God? I don't know anything about this God. Why are you doing this, Moshe and Aaron? Why are you disturbing the people from their work? The people are supposed to work. Why are you disturbing them? And again, Pharaoh is emphasizing, and it's important to read this, really, chapter 5, all of chapter 5. Pharaoh is emphasizing the point that you're trying to get them to stop working. And that's intolerable. And Pharaoh increases the work. And he tells the taskmen and the foremen, don't give straw to the people and maintain the quota. Because they're lazy. They don't want want to work. Let the work be heavier upon the men. Let them engage in it. And let them not pay attention to false words. This idea that Pharaoh doesn't want them to have the space, the time, the focus, the capacity to pay attention to anything else. Now, I'm going to suggest as we shall proceed that this is really the essence of the experience in Egypt. Of course, the Jewish people's experience in Egypt is really the founding experience of our people. This is when a family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of course, and the 70 souls, but the family is transformed into a nation. And it's kind of amazing that our, our nation was founded in exile in a foreign land, which is kind of very unique. I think it's the only example of that. Our nation has been founded in Egypt. And the essence, I will suggest, is all about this idea that Pharaoh wants to constrict their worldview to disable any competing thoughts of consideration of other alternative ways of life, to banish all of that from their purview. Now, our sages tell us that Pharaoh, on an allegorical level, he represents the Yetzer Hara. Of course, we know that the Torah is multidimensional. That's the theme of year eight of the Parsha podcast. It's deep and deeper to try try to see a bit deeper into the substrata of the Parsha. And as they just tell us that on an allegorical level, Pharaoh is the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. And whatever Pharaoh did to the Israelites, that is precisely what the Yetzirah does to us. So the whole story of the nation going down to Egypt and being subjugated to Pharaoh and being swallowed up and engulfed by Pharaoh and there's a need to be extricated from there and it's not simple at all. That's not just an ancient historical tale, the founding event of our people. This is also the story of our lives. Each one of us is sent down to Egypt. Each one of us is subjected to a fierce and conniving Pharaoh. And each one of us has to find a path out of Egypt and towards Sinai, towards God, towards Torah. There's a Midrash that I dedicated a chapter in my book on that talks about, or gives an analogy, a parable of a man, a sailor, who was on a ship. And the captain of the ship tossed him overboard. He was thrown to the ferocious waters below. And he's going to drown. And the ship captain takes a lifeline and throws it, casts it into the water and tells the flailing 
sailor, grab onto this lifeline. Hold on really tight. And I'll pull you up. I'll bring you back on board the ship deck. And the Midrash explains this is the model. God, so to speak, the captain, you know, he has our soul in close proximity to him. But he takes the soul and throws it into this world. And the soul is going to drown. It's going to... It's, it's going to be swallowed up by these raging waters, the eight sarah, the, the physicality, all the forces that are designed to inflict tremendous damage to the soul. But the Imadi also throws us a lifeline, and that's the Torah. And that's symbolized by the mitzvah that incorporates all of Torah, namely that of the tzitzis, which is the ropes, the streams, the fringes. You see the tzitzis, you remember all the mitzvahs, of Hashem, because you remember what the mitzvahs are all about. They're about pulling you out of that sea and bringing you to close proximity to God the way you were prior. V'hisem k'doshim, you should be holy to your God, we say in chapter 15 of Numbers regarding tzitzis. The objective of mitzvahs is to pull us back to proximity to the Almighty. But God throws us into the water God throws us into Egypt. God throws us into the clutches of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the Yitzhahara, the evil inclination, the force that's designed and engineered to really threaten, to really imperil the well-being of our soul. And whatever Pharaoh is doing to the Israelites is instructive for us because that's precisely the nature of our struggle against the Yitzhahara. And therefore, it's critical to understand what's happening here. What does Pharaoh want? What's he doing to the nation? What exactly is this enslavement all about? And here's where the tide turns. This is when the intensification of the enslavement becomes the strongest. They're not given straw they're not giving the ingredients of the bricks, and they still need to maintain the quota. And why, Pharaoh says himself, to be so consumed with work that this whole idea that you know you have a higher version of yourself and you have the capacity of self-determination and you may have lofty ambitions and you may remember that the, you, you're the Israelites, you're the scions of titans, of the greatest of men, and that you have a destiny to continue and expand upon the work of your illustrious antecedents. All these elevated ideals, Pharaoh wanted them silenced. Pharaoh wanted them suppressed. Pharaoh wanted that there will not be the capacity to have these sentiments expressed. That's what Pharaoh wanted. That was his aim. And that is precisely what the Yetzirah does to us. The most effective tool that our arch villains, so both Pharaoh and the Itzara, that they have in their arsenal, in their repertoire, in their quiver, in their toolkit, is to encumber us with so much that we don't have the ability to ever hear Moshe, to ever hear what he has to say. And the most encouraging and inspiring messages, we don't even hear him. And the idea that God wants a relationship with us, and he wants to take us to him, and he wants that we should be his people, and he wants to remove all the difficulties in our lives, we don't hear it. It doesn't penetrate. We're in our own world, hermetically sealed, and fending off all the messages the motion may be delivering to us. And if this is one of the major problems that we face, we also know what the solution to this problem is. How do we respond? What is the way to counter this force? There's an incredible piece in Masil Sisharm that's the, the way of the upright from Ramchal, where he talks about the importance of contemplation, of consideration, 
of finding the time and the space to consider, to open up your mind to what you're doing, to what you're living for, to what agendas really should dominate your life, what what you should invest your time in. So I want to read some citations from chapter 2 and chapter 3 about this. He says like this. He's talking about the importance to be fastidious in your life, to make sure you're making the right decisions, to be meticulous, to be vigilant in your behavior. And he says the way to do that is to have contemplation and to oversee and to consider your actions and your deeds. What's the most powerful way to live an elevated and perfected life? To have time where you consider what you're doing, and you evaluate what you're doing, and you assess what you're doing, and you oversee your life. You don't just live being led like a puppet by others, other forces. You become the master. You're in charge. You're at the wheel. You're at the helm. You made a decision of what you want to do in your life. And then he says, if you don't do this, you're going to allow your soul, this is his words, scary stuff, you're going to endanger it with potentially destruction. You should not be like a blind man fumbling about in the dark, that's the state of someone who just lives life without consideration, without contemplation, without ever assessing what they're doing with their lives. And he says that this this is the most logical thing that a person should do. If the Almighty gives you a brain, an intellect, to save yourself from devastation, why should you ignore it? There is no lunacy as terrible as that. And then he says that someone who lives a life that he never contemplates, he never considers, he never evaluates, he never assesses, he never tries to get outside of himself to look at themselves. He says such a person is worse than an animal. Animals are scared of danger. Animals never willfully embrace something which could be harmful to them. If a person is never considering, well, maybe I'm doing something which is harmful, which is deleterious, a favorite word here on the Parsha podcast. Well, in a certain dimension, they're worse than animals, says Ramchal. And he, again, uses very, very strong words, and he gives an analogy. If someone walks in their world, you have a life, right? It's your world. And you're walking, if you're walking in your world... And you're not ever considering, contemplating whether or not your decisions and your choices are good or bad. Behold, such a person, says Ramchal, is like a blind person who's walking at the edge of the river. Such a person, their danger is is ever-present. And they are on the brink of disaster. And then he compares, he says, when someone lives a life of lack of contemplation, it's it's willful blindness. If they don't consider what's the right thing to do, what should I choose, what what's a good thing that I should embrace, and what's a, what's a bad thing that I should avoid, that I should eschew. Here's the critical line. Behold, this is a quote. This is, truthfully, one of the schemes of the Yitzhara. One of the cunning schemes of the Yitzhara is to encumber a person with work, with nonstop, incessant work. So that way the person's heart is always occupied. And they don't have the space to contemplate and to do some introspection and to examine and to look on the path that they're living. That's what the Yetzirah does. Because the Yetzirah knows that if a person would only just a little bit for a small amount of time consider just a little bit a person's path, 
right away. They'd improve their ways. And they would regret any bad decisions that they made. And all the sins and all the mistakes that they are prone to do, they'll now avoid it. And then he tells us, this is what Pharaoh did. This was the plan of Pharaoh. Encumber them with work. What was Pharaoh's intention? His intention was that they would not have any space to consider, to pay attention, to examine, to plot. He wanted to fill their hearts, fill their times, fill their lives. There's no room for anything else to creep in. Any thought of introspection and contemplation, because they're working nonstop and there's not even a time to catch their breath, they'll never consider anything. So too, this is what the Yetzirah does. The Yetzirah, he tells us that this is a man of war and is well trained in deception. And there's no way to fight back unless you too use deception. He quotes the verse as he does. Every point that he makes, he supports it with a verse in Scripture. Now, I noticed that the very first mention of the Egyptian exile, of the state of the Jewish people inside Egypt, it's found in the first verse of Parshas Vayechi. So this is still chapter 47 of Genesis. This is the final Parsha installment of the book of Genesis, 12 of 12. And the verse talking about how Jacob lived in Egypt. And Rashi observes that there's something found in the beginning of that Parsha, so Parsha's Vayichi, that's not found in any other Parsha. So you have 54 Parshas in the Torah. One of them has this feature that no one else has. And that is that in, in a Torah scroll, typically there's a paragraph break separating one Parsha from another. Just like if you have a different book, you know, between the book, books of, uh, of Genesis and Exodus, you have four empty lines. So it's very easy to spot it. If you're scrolling through a Torah scroll, you'll see when there's just big blank, four empty lines, you know that you've reached a point between two books. But similarly, between two parishes, there's always, almost always, there is a paragraph break. But between Parshas Vayigash, the 11th installment in Genesis, and Parshas Vayichi, the final one, there's no break. And if you read it from the Torah, it's hard to find it because it's, it's right in the middle of a whole sea of, of words. And the first comment that Rashi offers on the Parsha, Parshas Vayichi, why is this Parsha all closed up? Why is there no white space? Why is there you don't have the typical paragraph break that you have in every other parsha. Because this is talking about the death of Jacob. And once Jacob died, the hearts and the eyes of the nation were closed up because of the suffering of enslavement. Once Jacob died, the nation was enslaved. And the way that the Torah finds it fitting to represent their enslavement is to remove the white space, is to remove the paragraph break. That's the essence of exile. The first indication of the subjugation of our nation, that all rhymed, the first indication of subjugation of our nation, is a lack of white space. There's no time to contemplate, to consider. By the way, the purpose of paragraph breaks, we find out in, in Rashi, in Parshas Vayikra, so this is the beginning of Leviticus, it's easy to find it. Chapter 1, verse 1. Rashi talks about why there are paragraph breaks in the Torah. And he says, it's to give you time, and even to give Moshe time, to stop and think and contemplate and have some introspection. The reason why there are paragraph breaks in the Torah, it's not so we should skip the breaks. 
There's a way to read the brights. Don't jump to the next line. You spend the time that it would take to read it by not reading, by stopping, by considering, by contemplating. And there's different types of brights. There's ones where it's just, you know, a few spaces within one line. And then sometimes the break goes all the way to the end of the line. And like we said, there are some times that you have four empty lines. You're supposed to have a lot of contemplation. The Almighty did not pepper Moshe with an uninterrupted salvo of teachings. No. He taught something, and then he stopped. That doesn't mean that Moshe is supposed to space out. He's supposed to consider, to pause, and consider, and try to absorb the message, try to digest it, to reflect upon it. And says Rashi, again, this is in Bayekra 1.1, if God teaching Moshe, it requires pauses and breaks for reflection, certainly when we learn, it requires breaks and reflection. The white space in the Torah, that too is instructive. And what it tells us is now it's a time to stop. Stop and reconsider. Stop and absorb. Stop and have some introspection. Stop and allow the emptiness, so to speak, to be helpful to you. And the first thing that we're shown in the Torah, the beginning of the exile in Egypt, is the lack of white space. Because their hearts were closed up. Their eyes were clammed up. And there's no break. That's how it starts. That's the first beginning of the exile. And here, chapter 6, verse 9, this is the, this is really the end. Because once we pass by this verse, it's the redemption. The first early stages of the redemption, of course, the seven, the seven plagues in our Parsha, three plagues in Etrus Parsha, Parsha's bow, spoiler alert, and the Exodus. So this is the end, really, of the exile. And the last thing we hear about in the exile is they cannot hear Moshe. Why? Because they were working nonstop, and there was no way for it to penetrate. There's no white space. There's no availability for something to land upon their hearts. Thus, the bookends of the nation's enslavement in Egypt, the first indication, the last indication, that of course always reveals to us the essence of it. And it's all about the removing of the white space of the capacity and the time to reflect, to ponder, to consider, to evaluate, to assess, and to contemplate. And again, this is not just important for us, you know, as trying to study with the events of your the events of 3,300 years ago, our nation in Egypt. Everything that we read about Pharaoh is true about the Yitzhara. And this is a primary tool of the Yitzhara, just as it was the primary tool of Pharaoh. And if you want to triumph over it, you want to win, you need to carve out some white space. You need to make sure that there's time for reflection. I want to read for you another short citation from Ramchal. This is not from Masil Sisharm, the way of the upright, from, but from instead a, a different work with the very exciting and compelling title of Derech Eitzchaim, the way of the tree of life. And in it, he has a powerful statement on how important self-reflection, self-introspection, life analysis, how important these things all are. And he says, listen, you know, people, when people think, most of the time they're thinking about their temporary life, the life of the body, the life that won't really matter in 100 years from now, certainly not in 150 years from now. If people spend so much time thinking about their temporary life, why don't they spend an hour thinking about, contemplating the life that's actually consequential, 
their permanent life, the life of their soul? How come they don't take the time to think about who they are, what they are, what they're here to do? Why did the Almighty give them such a lofty soul? Why did the Almighty place them in this world? What does Hashem, what does Almighty God want of us? What will be at the end? What's our plan for the afterlife? And then he says, again, this is Ramchal, a very, very reputable source. So I'll read it to you in Hebrew, so you know I'm not fudging the translation here. This is the trufa. What's trufa? Trufa in Hebrew. Got practice our Hebrew. Trufa. All of us need to brush up on our Hebrew. Trufa means medicine. This is the most potent and great, just to, I want to be accurate in translation here, medicine that can possibly be conceived. Neged Hayetzer. Opposite. In opposition to the Yetzhara. Vihikala, and it's easy. Upuulasa gedola, and its effectiveness, or what it effectuates, is great. Upiria rav, and its fruits are manifold. This is the best medicine against the Yetzhara that a person should stand. Again, this is a quote every day. Lefachot sha'a. At least an hour. Panui, available. Cleared from all other thoughts. To only think about this. To only be introspective. And you should inspect in your heart. What did the earlier ones, the forefathers, why were they so desirous by God? What did Moshe do what did David do? What's a good thing to do? What's a good way to live? Rabchal tells us here that the most potent and powerful and effective tool against the Yitzhara, which again is the force trying to destroy us, the primary reason why we're here is to fight the Yitzhara. And the most potent tool to combat it is introspection. It's time where you're not thinking about anything else there's no other competing thoughts that are dominating your perspective. And you're able to think about your life. And what you're here to do. What's the goal? What Hashem wants of you? Why were you placed on this earth? What's your mission in life? How do you live up to your abilities? How do you make the most of your potential? An hour a day, at least an hour a day, he says. At least an hour a day. I want to tell you a cool story that I read in a memoir written by one of my grandfather's students. You know, the the Musser masters, they had a, a, a theme that they like, like to repeat. That is that our life and the things that happen to us in our life, that's a form of Torah. What happens to you doesn't happen to you randomly. We know there's no coincidence, no happenstance. Everything is calculated. Everything it's, comes from Hashem. It comes from the Almighty. Well, if it comes from the Almighty, then it's like Torah. It's like a prophecy. And you need to study it and find out what the message is. You have to learn from the events that transpire in your life. This hour that Ramchal is encouraging us to spend every day, a minimum of an hour. Now, don't feel bad. Don't feel guilty. We're all guilty of this. Is there, are there 10 people in the world that do this? I don't know. Probably not. Maybe yes, I don't know. He says it's easy. It's easy. And this is the most effective Ammunition against the Yetzhara. An hour a day. Thinking about life. What you're living for. But it has to be an hour that you're clear of anything else. There's no other thoughts that are dominating your perspective. What's the result of this? What is a person who actually engages in 
and self-analysis, clears out all the other thoughts and examines our life, thinks inwardly, not just externally. There's not, nothing else. There's no, there's no phone, no devices, no radio, no television, no people even. It's just you and you're thinking inwardly. So one of my grandfather's students, he wrote something unbelievable in his memoir. You know, most of us, our, our lives are just like an, an unidentified blob. With my grandfather, a blessed memory, everything was well thought out. Everything that happened to him was indexed, so to speak, in his, in his mind as a form of Torah. And the story is told in this book about one of my grandfather's students who, and my grandfather was a very famous rabbi, and someone who many people sought his counsel. They had a problem in their lives and they wanted to speak to someone who was a wise person, who was an experienced person, who could give them some direction. So, this student of my grandfather, my grandfather tells him, there's another student who has, has a question, has a life dilemma. And I want you to speak with him. Now, this student, the one who was given this task, he's trying to figure out, like, what's the angel over here? After all, you know, you're the expert. Thousands of people come and ask you questions and seek your counsel and seek your advice. Read your books. Study from your lectures. You're the expert. I'm, I'm a 23 year old student. That's, it happens to identify the student's age. What's happening over here? So he comes over to my grandfather and, and says, what's going on over here? So my grandfather responded to him, listen to this. He responded to him, let me explain to you. People come to me with all sorts of problems. And every, every, every problem is unique. I'm not a prophet. How can I help someone who has a problem and I'm not a prophet. How can I help them? What's his methodology of assisting people who reach out and seek counsel for their dilemmas? So my grandfather tells the student, he says, I have a, in my head, I have a, a ladder. And on the ladder, there are hundreds of rungs. And every rung is associated with something that happened to me in my life. Something that happened to me, well, if it happened to me, I, I know the story. I know the factors and the variables at play. So when someone comes and asks me for advice, I don't just guess what the answer is. I don't just spitball and speculate. I reference my my ladder and i try to find which one of my life episodes corresponds to this person's problem to find what's the solution because i went through what they went through on some level in some dimension and if it happened to me well i i know how it played out and i know the variables and other factors so i'm always scanning that that internal Ladder. Now, this other person, this other student who came to ask me a question, I stand and I stand and I don't find the answer. And therefore, I thought, how can I give this person advice when I don't know the answer? So I thought maybe you would have the answer. So maybe you try to answer this, this other student's dilemma. No, the, there is an epilogue to the story that the uh, the student who was giving the advice, after he gave the advice, 
my grandfather debriefed him and he pointed out all the mistakes that he made in giving advice. He says, you did this mistake because of this reason, because you have this and this predisposition or bias. But to me, this story and this, this model of how you could become a student of your own life. You, you really should be writing your own autobiography because every event that happens to you in your life, that's like a lesson from the Almighty. And you have to study it. And when do you study it? When do you study the most important Torah that's tailored for you? For most people, the answer is never. They're total strangers to their own life. They don't have necessarily a ladder with hundreds of rungs of every event that happened to them in, in their lives and what the lessons were, what the variables, what the factors were. And what, were the, what was the correct response? What was the wrong response? What were the biases that were at play beforehand? My grandfather, bless memory, did spend an hour every day in that white space with no other disruptions and no other factors that were intruding. And he became a student of his own life. And of course, once you become a student of real life, you're able to help other people as well. To me, this is a life-changing lesson. And again, I think it's, it's easy to talk about and it makes sense. It's very hard to implement and it's especially hard today because people used to have used to have, you know, some white space in their lives. When you're waiting to check out at the grocery store or you're waiting by a red light. I I already told y'all on the podcast that whenever I'm by a, a red light and I'm a few cars behind, once the light, and I gotta make a left turn, so it's a short light, once the light turns green, I already, I already beep because I assume, I assume that most of them are on their phones. I'll tell you, I did this like hundreds of times. Don't judge me. I did it hundreds of times and no one ever complained because everyone knows everyone's on their phones. You buy a red light. What do you do? There's a, a small little bit of white space that could save your life. But let's fill it with a little bit of the uh, iFaro 16, iFaro 14. The eights are odds dominating. He's in full control. There's always something to do. There's a steady stream. He could stroll endlessly. Of course, I know it's, it's emails, it's important emails, it's important text messages. And I have to say, I don't have an Instagram account, but I, I, I can't judge someone because I, I have no interest in it. Certainly not. TikTok. I'm too old for this. I'm too old. Even though I'm technically a millennial, but I'm one of those older millennials. I did have a, still do have a weakness for Twitter. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say this, but I don't think it's a cause for, for pride. When Yom Kippur came, I made a resolution to not look at Twitter even once until the first day of Hanukkah. And I'm happy to say that I was successful in that undertaking. And then, of course, the war breaks out and everyone's getting all their steady stream of news and I don't really have that. But to me, like, this is an important step or these kinds of initiatives are important to carve out some white space. What's Pharaoh doing? The beginning of the story is that the, the, the nation, their hearts and their minds and their eyes are closed up. And that's reflected in the Torah. There's no white space. And at the very end, Moshe's saying an encouraging message. He's saying good things. He's saying things that should provide a modicum of comfort. But Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his devious plans, he removed any white space. There's just work. That's the beginning. That's the end of Egypt. That's the entirety of it. And just as Pharaoh did, the Yitzhahara does. And if we want to win, if we want to overcome, if we want to take those lessons, that, that Torah of our own life, 
We got to find that white space. And once you have the white space, cherish it, utilize it, and use, again, what he, what the Ramchal says is the most productive use of your time. To consider your soul, to consider your afterlife, to figure out what you're here to do. What does Hashem want of you? That's the most important question that any person can ever ask. I told my wife, <laughs> I really, I really want to do one week without my phone. Maybe after the fundraiser, after the fundraiser in February. Wouldn't that be a nice challenge to do a whole week without your phone? We used to live in a very different world. In a world that there was white space baked into daily living. Today, it's a very different rhythm of life. And that's the primary damage, the spiritual damage of social media, of any sort of media that can fill up any space. I think it's also one of the most amazing benefits of Shabbos. You know, Jews, since the Exodus, we've been keeping Shabbos. And not doing all the categories of work that are prohibited on Shabbos. Today, it's so critical to modern living because if you don't have it, there's never any time. <laughs> it's a crazy thing. There's never any, any time where someone's alone. You wake up and your phone's next to your bed and you go to sleep and your phone's next to your bed and at every time throughout the day, it's within hand's reach. Now, of course, it's important. You got to listen to the podcast. I know that. But have to remember, this is the beginning and this is the end of Pharaoh, of Egypt, of the Sahara. It's all about closing any windows of examination and contemplation and consideration. And if we're serious about extricating ourselves from Egypt, we must wage a campaign against the scourge of Egypt, the scourge of Pharaoh, the elimination of any moment of contemplation. Let's carve out that window. Let's find some white space. That will change our lives. I thank you for listening. This was enjoyable. I am so delighted that I came to the Torch Center to record this podcast. The streak continues. It's a joyous day in our family. I hope your family as well is safe, is doing well, is flourishing. Have a wonderful rest of your day. A sensational rest of your week. And uh, an elevating, edifying, uplifting, meaningful, and productive Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with help of the Almighty, we'll talk again next week. And of course, the email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.